Let's compare two of the most important tanks of 1941, the German Panzerkampfwagen 3 Ausführung H and the Sober T-34 Model 41. Now usually people look mainly at the raw data, aka the stats. This will be done here as well, yet very briefly, because I think the more important aspect is to actually qualify or disqualify the stats based on a more thorough and holistic look at the overall situation while staying in the technical and tactical domain. So let's look at the chosen criteria, namely firepower, ergonomics and visibility, armor protection, mobility and communications. These are influenced by various factors, for instance manufacturing quality and the quality of production materials. Yet unlike Saloga, I don't consider crew training a factor, nor availability like Cavalercik does, since I focus on the technical tactical level. As such, we look at the finished tank. Additionally, assuming that the tank is properly maintained and has a standard ammunition loadout. So, no Panzergranate 46 spam. As such, let's start with firepower. The Panzer III came with the short belt 50mm gun, the 5cm Kampfwagen Kampfkanone L42, whereas the T 34 had the 76mm gun F34. We are looking at the penetration values against armor plates at a 30 degree angle. And as you can see here, the F-34 has clearly better penetration values. Even at 1500 meters, the 76mm armor piercing shell has a higher penetration value than the Panzergranate 930 of the Panzer III at 100 meters. It is rather apparent that the Soviet gun is far better in terms of penetration, yet it also had a far better high explosive power than the German 50mm gun. After all, the 50mm shell was significantly smaller and lighter with around 2kg, whereas the 76mm shell had around 6kg. Note, this was the total weight, not the high explosive charge. Of course, it should be added that the Germans also had the Panzergranate 40, which was a high velocity armor piercing projectile with a tungsten core. At 100 meters distance, it had a higher penetration than both the regular shell and that of the T-34, namely 94mm. Yet this was a specialized shell that was rather rare. As a result, supplies were modest with most German tanks receiving only about 5 rounds of this type of ammo in summer 1941. As such, I don't consider it as a standard ammunition loadout. Furthermore, its penetration capabilities drop sharply over distance. At a range of 500 meters, they were down to 55 millimeters. As such, it has little influence on our assessment. Yet firepower is not just about penetration values and the high explosive power in your shell. As Kavalercik points out, the firepower of tanks is determined by the ability of the armaments to destroy the designated targets. However, to start with, it needs to get a hit on the target and there much depends on the capabilities of the sites. Here is one major issue, the optics of Soviet tanks were of lower quality than the German ones. As such, the probability to hit was lower. The German tanks were equipped with telescopic sights with a magnification factor similar to that of the Soviets, yet the field of vision was 23.5 to 25 degree with the Panzer III, whereas the T-34 had only a field of vision of 14.5 degree. Which means that at the same range the Soviet gunner saw through his sight about a third of the area the German gunner could see. This problem was further hampered by the fact that the Soviet sight led only about 39% of the light through. As a result, in good light conditions, the Soviet could engage at around 800 meters, whereas the Germans could engage about 1,500 meters. Although this was natural due to the limited penetration values and common engagement ranges in summer 1941. Yet in low light conditions like fog, rain or snow, the Germans had a distinctive advantage. This is also pointed out by Saloga. The optical quality of Soviet tank sites was inferior to their German counterparts of the key optics factories were evacuated in 1941. A Soviet tank commander recalled, we always recognized the high quality of the Zeiss gun sites. We had nothing like that. Kavalercik also notes that there were issues with the brittleness of Soviet shells, but he only offers evidence against the armor of the Tiger. Additionally, reports from tank archives were firing against various Panzers conducted did not show any issues. As such, I don't think this was an issue in summer 1941. One factor that definitely decreased the T-34's firepower was that its actual rate of fire, accuracy and aiming time were suboptimal. As pointed out by a letter to the People's Commissar of the Armor Industry in March 1943, at which point the T-34 was already matured. 
One of the main design flaws of the T-34 tank, which significantly reduces its combat power, is the low rate of fire, low speed aiming, and low accuracy of the tank's fire. So taking these aspects into account, the T-34 is the winner in the firepower category, although not by a wide margin. It is also important to point out that Cavalerci comes actually to a different assessment. In short, the armaments of the Soviet tank seemed impressive only on paper, in reality its effectiveness left much to be desired. This is due to the fact that he uses different criteria. And since one of these criteria is very crucial for understanding Operation Barbarossa, I covered it in a separate video on my second channel. So be sure to check it out there. Yet for now, let's move on to the next factor, namely ergonomics. And thus it is time to let the man speak that actually has been inside both tanks and also a ton of others. Mainly Nicholas Morin, aka the Chieftain. The Panzer III was a very good tank with its flaws. I'm not going to say it's a perfect tank. I mean, if you had to change your transmission on it, God help you. But I, in my 1 meter 98 self, fit very nicely in the Panzer III. I can operate a Panzer III, no problem, any position. Uh, it's very good for me. And so, of course, the average German crewman of the time would have been very comfortable and very effective. Not so much for the T-34s. The testing of the T-34, the optics, came in for a fair bit of slagging uh, from the testing staff. They were not satisfied with the visibility that came from the T-34, from any position, from the driver, from the commander, from the gunner. Uh, the all-around sight had a 120-degree field of vision, which is fantastic if it wasn't obstructed by a few other things. It did have the advantage that it was a, there was a periscopic sight that uh, you could ambush from hold down positions but again you have a couple of problems with the crew overload and a lack of training so the t-34 crews couldn't properly use it the germans at least well they had a cupola so the tc could find the targets the gunner did not have a periscopic sight which is a failing of many german vehicles although curiously the assault guns did not have this problem and they, they, they had pretty reasonable optics good good clarity and a relatively wide field vision from the optics that they had. So they could find the targets much faster, they could service, uh, lay on the target much faster, and they could pump more rounds at the target. So there you have now, your space has been taken up by the suspension, your uh, armor has taken up space, your optics aren't what they should be, your crew are completely overloaded, there are issues, of course, simply with operating the vehicle as a driver. And the gear shift is famously bad, uh, especially the first few hundred vehicles, although they started to fix that a little bit. God help the bow gunner who can't see a thing uh, and has no hatch of his own, so God help him if he has to bail out. Um, I think you can see where I'm starting to go here. The T-34 on paper was a fantastic vehicle, and it would eventually develop into a very good vehicle. 1940-41 though, it was nowhere near capable of living up to what the paper statistics said it could. The German vehicle, well that was designed and was as capable of what it was designed to do. Many of the issues mentioned by Schiff were due to the fact that the T-34 did not have a free man to it unlike the Panzer III. As such, the T-34 commander was occupied with duties that did not involve spotting and commanding a tank, which further reduced the chances of spotting an enemy, coordination effectiveness with the crew and other tanks. Additionally, a lack of proper vision devices was hard to circumvent, since the T-34's tank's poor hatch design prevented tank commanders from riding with their heads outside of the tanks. As such, the Germans soon adapted. In the summer of 1941, a German instruction pamphlet on ways to counter Soviet tanks recommended firing at them with ordinary machine guns, starting at a range of 800 meters in order to force the tank to close hatches. Well, so much for taking a glance out of a T-34. Hence, in terms of ergonomics and visibility, the Panzer III is the clear winner, which means the overall combat effectiveness of the T-34 was severely reduced in many other aspects. As Chifton pointed out, one of the reasons for the limited crew comfort was the sloped arm of the T-34. So let's look at the armor protection next. This means looking at the armor plates and the angling. Since the angle determines the effective thickness, note that sloped armor also increases the chances of the shot to bounce as well. If you want to learn more about armor protection in general, be sure to check out my video on it. And for now, let's hop back to our tanks. 
And here you can see the armor plate strength and the effective thickness of the Panzerkampfangriff Ausführung H and the T-34 model for 1941. As you can clearly see, the T-34's armor was in many aspects superior to the Panzer III. So Logan notes, the T-34 represented a revolutionary step forward in medium tank design. Its armor was unusually effective for a medium tank, although about the same thickness the latest Panzerkampfwagen 4 Ausführung F, the severe sloping of the armor doubled its protective effectiveness without a corresponding increase in vehicle weight. Although Chifton makes a very good point that sloped armor was actually not that revolutionary. The armor, I've mentioned the sloped armor on the T-34 and this is university hailed as a revolutionary or a good thing. I mean, well, there's nothing revolutionary about it. Sloped armor goes back to World War I. You look at an FT, it's sloped. You look at a German A7V from World War I, it's sloped. It's not as if the Germans didn't understand sloped armor and then the Soviets had this epiphany of sloped armor. Your problem is volumetric. When you slope the armor inwards, you are stealing room from inside the tank. Room that can be used for stowing ammunition, room that can be used for stowing crewmen, Room that can be used for giving crewmen a little bit of elbow room to operate efficiently. And even the Soviets realized eventually it was a stupid idea. Look, the successor to the T-34 is the T-44. Yet this is not the full part of the story. The quality of steel, the welding and auto manufacturing aspects affected the strength of the armor plates. For instance, Germany used mainly rolled armor for Haas and turrets. In general, rolled armor is about 15% better in resistance to shock and penetration in cast armor. However, this advantage is offset to some extent by the varying angles of obliquity and irregular shapes possible in castings. The problem was that the Soviets for quite some time used steel that was not ideal for casting the turrets of the T-34. Another aspect was that the armor plates and the manufacturing quality of the T-34 was often lackluster. The full strength penetration welding used was different from the German approach and could severely inflict the quality of the armor. In the process, because of overheating the armor around the weld joints and burning out of the carbon and alloy elements in it, the strength of the armor fell by two to four times. As a result, 37mm armor piercing shells could penetrate the frontal of the early T-34 in the vicinity of the nose crossbeam and in other places where welded parts came together. Sometimes the welding could also lead to cracks within the armor. However, perhaps the main reason for the cracks was the low quality of the armor. The point is that the USSR at the time did not have enough precise instrument to control the temperature and chemical composition of the metal in the furnaces, and thus the smelting was frequently a matter of guesswork. Although generally the T-34 could not be penetrated by a 30mm shell, it was clearly not immune to those shells as often claimed. This is validated by the Soviet statistics from June 1941 to September 1942 on the losses of the T-34s. 4.7% of them were knocked out by 20mm shells, 10% by 37mm shells, 61.8% by 50mm shells, 10.1% by 75mm shells, 3.4% by 88mm shells and 2.9% by 105mm shells. The caliber of the shells that knocked out the remaining 7.1% of these tanks could not be identified. As always, statistics can be a bit tricky. Note that the 20mm shell were actually 50mm shots with tungsten core that had a diameter of 20mm as Peter from tank archives informed me. Additionally, it is quite interesting that the famous 88mm flag only accounted for less than 4% of the losses. Anyway, let's conclude on this information. In terms of armor protection, the T-34 was superior to the Panzer III. Although effectiveness of the T-34's armor was negatively affected by manufacturing techniques and material quality, in overall, this seemed to have only have a limited impact. Still around 10% were knocked out by 30mm guns, yet likely under special circumstances. This becomes more apparent if we consider that the German army in June 1941 had a total of 15,700 pieces of 37mm guns and only 2,100 pieces of 50mm guns as anti-tank guns or mounted in tanks. This also illustrates the effectiveness of the 50mm guns killing the T-34s especially since around 50% of the 50mm guns in 1941 were mounted in Panzer III's. Well, but don't let's get too far off track here, since Heinz Guderian, who is seen by Massam as the father of the Panzerwaffe, famously noted, the engine of the Panzer is his weapon, just as the main gun. As such, let's look at the mobility ratings of our two beauties next. Although the Panzer III had only a weight of 21.5 tons, it had weaker numbers in all other regards. 
Its max speed was just 40 km per hour in comparison to 55 of the T34. Also, it had a higher ground pressure by 0.2 kg per square centimeter, and the horsepower to ton ratio was around 14 against the almost 18 by the T34. Yet again, there are other elements that reduce the gap between the two. The T34 had issues with air filter and cooling systems, which limited its capabilities in summertime. For example, in 1941 to 1943, when the air temperature was above 25 degrees Celsius, the T-34's engine would overheat after 12 minutes running at 400 horsepower. In these conditions, it could continually generate only 315 horsepower, which limited the tank speed to 30 km per hour. Although the same author noted earlier that experience had shown that the tank in combat rarely reached its top speed, it still affects the overall performance of the T-34. What was more of an issue for the T-34 was its Christie suspension. Although it offered many benefits like additional protection due to the large wheels, increased service life and reduced resistance, it took up more space inside the tank. And one of the main problems was the lack of shock absorbers. This was in stark contrast to the Panzer III, which had one of the best suspensions at the time, based on the torsion bar system, which is still used today, unlike the Christie suspension. Yet the overall effect of this was limited since the cross-country performance, especially in mud and snow, of the T-34 was clearly superior. Although the Panzer III clearly offered a more convenient ride, in overall it had a weaker value than T-34 here. Yet the determining factor that makes the T-34 a clear winner here is its cross-country performance. Because so far, even communists were unable to make South Russia run out of mud and snow. So let's move to the last factor, namely communications. This is a crucial element, since war is a team effort, especially with tanks, since tank crew members are very dependent on each other. As noted in the German Field Manual, every man of the crew must have the clear awareness that mistakes and omissions by the individual may result in the loss of the tank and the entire crew. Additionally, tanks need to support each other as well, as explained in a previous video on German Panzer tactics. As such, onboard communications and communication with other tanks is paramount for combat effectiveness of the individual tank and tank units. So let's take a look at the basic data. For communications between tanks, the Red Army used the 71 TK3 radio set. The theoretical range stationary was around 25 km and 15 to 18 km in motion, depending on the source. The intercom system of the T-34 was limited to the commander and driver. Meanwhile, the Panzer III had the FU-2 and FU-5, with a range in motion of around 2 to 3 km with voice. The Panzer's intercom system connected the commander, driver and radio man. In 1941, the system was improved to include the gunner as well, but I found no information if this conversion was completed before Barbarossa. While in theory, the Soviet radio system clearly seems better, yet there were many problems with it. One of it was that it was only available in limited numbers. Only one in four T-34s had a radio installed. The other tanks had to use flags and flares to communicate. This was in contrast to the German Panzers that usually had at least a receiver, thus be able to receive orders whereas platoon commanders and upwards were equipped with two-way communications. Furthermore, the Soviet radio sets had various shortcomings and did not perform to specifications. For example, the 71 TK3 radio set, although theoretically having a range on the move of up to 15 km in practice, had a range on the move of about 6 km and was, according to one tanker, a complex, unreliable radio set, very often it failed and it was very difficult to get it working again. One issue was that the frequency drifted and needed regular tuning. In October 1941, the Swords conducted a test of the German radio set and concluded Judging by all basic characteristics, the radio set of the German tank is superior to that installed in the domestic tank. I consider it useful to conduct the design and development of a new type of tank radio on the basis of the available German models. The issue with the intercom system of the Soviet tanks was similar. It barely worked, as such the commander and driver used to run a personal way to communicate with each other, which sounds a bit more romantic than it actually was. According to the recollections of a driver mechanic who served in one, Communications were handled by feet, which is to say I had the boots of the tank commander resting on my shoulders. He would push my left or right shoulder, which let me know whether to turn left or right and if he wanted to stop, he would tap my head. As such in the communications department, the Panzer III is the clear winner. So let's conclude, taking the pure stats of the T-34, it was clearly the superior tank on paper. But one doesn't fight on a piece of paper, one fights on the battlefield. 
Taking into account the various deviations from the design characteristics and minor yet crucial details like the performance of optics, the effects of ergonomics, the often stated major gap between the Panzer III and T-34 gets smaller in many aspects. This also explains to a certain degree why the impact of the T-34 was limited even though the number of T-34s in summer 1941 was not particularly low. After all, the Soviet Union had around 1,337 T-34s in mechanized cores. And in total almost 1,400 T-34s were present during the time of the invasion, although almost 400 of these were in factories. Whereas the Wehrmacht committed 976 Panzer III's to the Ostfront, of which some were still equipped with the Farmiga 37mm gun. The limited impact of the T-34 during this time goes beyond the technical tactical aspect covered in this video. Many of these factors were like the differences in crew training, doctrine, tactics and close air support and many other aspects in which the Wehrmacht had a clear edge in summer 1941. Yet from the various reports it's also apparent that the T-34 could deliver tactical shock to the Panzerwaffe several times, which are often cited for dramatic effect. Yet in overall the T-34 could be defeated quite regularly and thus had a limited impact on the operational level. This was also due to the lack of spare parts, ammunition and other elements that reduced the effectiveness and operational status of the T-34. For the strategic side it should be added that the T-34 was optimized for mass production, which sometimes resulted in less favorable technical solutions and reduced manufacturing quality. Additionally many improvements to its design were hard to do the start of the war. Since the Soviet Union opted for producing the T-34 with its norm flaws instead of switching to the T-34M design, as originally planned. The loss of important factories and machinery likely affected this decision as well. Anyway, let me know in the comment section or on Patreon what you think. Big thank you here to Chifton. Be sure to check out Chifton's video and his channel as well. Additional thanks to Peter from Tank Archives and Max Ravenclaw for helping me with data. Special thanks to Wolfgang, Jack, Malte and Matthew for sending me books that made this video possible. And of course, thank you to all my Patreons for keeping this channel going. Remember, every single dollar helps. Sources are in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.